for 63 year old me, I know exactly what that catalog fucking you means. So I'm glad we're allowed to swear because I've been fucked by that fucking Cadillac for 45 fucking years. Nice to see you again, Julia. So nice to see you, Sharon. Really, thank you for agreeing to that. I'm really thrilled to see you. It's great to see you. I have lots of questions. Your movie is incredible. Incredible. You You sure deserve the Palme (laughs) d'Or. What a great film. How old are you, Julia? I turned 38 a week ago. Congratulations and happy birthday. I'm 63 and... I was one of the biggest box office female stars in my generation. And for my generation, that had meant ever before I had made more box office money than anyone. And I could not get the studio to give me a budget to direct, not even the smallest budget. And when I asked them to do that, they laughed at me. And they continue to laugh at me for forever and the way that they treated me when i wanted to direct was so dismissive and so harsh and so as if i was a joke and i came with not only storyboards but shot by shot breakdowns of scripts with the music and with people telling me it was the best presentations they'd ever heard and yet It was a joke because a woman was not going to direct anything. So for me to be have the opportunity to present a young woman with the Palme d'Or for an avant-garde film about a woman was an extraordinary experience for me that in my lifetime enough had changed that was an extraordinary experience for me to see that the world was changing, that women were changing, that these wonderful women before us, like Agnes Varga, that all these other women that had tried so hard and done so much, that Thelma Schumacher being an editor, that these women who had done things in the film world had made it possible for you to direct, for you to make a film, for you to win. It was so thrilling for me. It was such a a moment. It was literally like seeing a baby being birthed on the stage. It was like standing there holding history in my hands and then to come and watch this film. uh, I have so many questions for you. I'd like to start with, I think, thank you for capturing female rage and anguish and the need on film. Just thank you. I just want to say thank you. These scenes where, how it starts, where she stands up for herself, the very next thing that happens is she's brutalized again. I'd like you to talk about that. I mean, I understand that so, so profoundly. I'd like you to talk about why you chose to start your film with this repetitive female experience. Well, the first thing is, it moves me a lot that you can relate to that rage. Yeah. That was the point. I had to, um, I had to, I know that there were people out there that I was talking to. So that's the first thing. I think I can put it, put it in like every theoretical way possible and analytical way possible uh, in order to explain why I chose to uh, create a character that was hyper-violent, far from her humanity, was going against every single um, feminine stereotype you could find of being softness, being polite, being nice, being good-looking, having a great body, uh, and all that shit. Sorry. Um, but I think that organically, I really need to get, I needed to get it out, that rage. And... I think that was definitely my only way to relate to that character at the beginning. And I thought, why not? 
that's a good way to relate to a character. And I don't need to morally sustain what she's doing to relate to her. I just need to feel what she feels, and this is something that I feel. Knowing that, I so I knew that she was going to kill a lot <laughs> in my film. I decided that I was not going to start with, for example, the killing spree in the house that you have, where she definitely right. kills everyone for no reason, and it's funny and all that. Right. I wanted to, to start with something that was more in the gray zone. After this long um, um, wonder in um, in the, the car show, where obviously there is this whole thing about every woman being objectified with a male gaze that is put on them through my camera that I'm trying to mimic the male gaze in order to just try to reverse it once I, I, I come on my main character who looks through the lens and so she's looking at you, you're no, you're no longer looking at her, she's looking at you. So now you're in her story, it's her action, it's her narrative. Even though she regained the narrative at this moment at, during her dance, she regains it still in the realm of something that is very, very diminishing for women. For me, as you say, it's like it goes on again. Why would it stop? Right. You know, why would it stop? Of course it goes on again. Because what does she look like? She looks like a victim because she wears thongs, because she dances like the way she dances. She looks like a victim. And the worst part is that doing that, I, I knew that it would be very obvious for everyone in the room that she has this written on her back, you know, she's a perfect victim. That's where the rage comes from, by the way. This idea that in the public space, which is the case in the parking lot, in the public space, a woman is necessarily a designated victim. I mean, there is no other, you know, no other way. That's why we, we build up theories, like we hold our keys in our hands, like we try to avoid certain streets, we try to not like, dress a certain way in order to get out. We wear these big sweater pants and stuff like that. All these strategies mean that we are still not equal. I mean, this is just the basis. We are not sharing the public space equally with men. That's not true. There, a lot has been done, but this is still on. This still exists. And I thought, so she does not escape that. She does yeah. not, like, she, she, she might be all the psycho, you know, psychopaths she wants. She does not escape that thing. You know, the only reason that she can change things in the realm of my film with my rules and my universe is that because she lacks this empathy, because she lacks emotions, she's not uh, she's not petrified like we are when we get assaulted. And that's the only reason why she can retaliate and kill that guy. She can retaliate because she does not feel that fear that we all feel. And that's how I launched her. Because she's so broken. Because she's so broken. She's so dysfunctional. She's, she's a death drive walking. She has no emotions whatsoever. Because they are just beaten out of her. Yeah, exactly. I love that she keeps going back to the shower because oh, yeah. she's, it's, this, it's this ritual that we go through where we are constantly trying to cleanse ourselves. We're constantly trying to cleanse ourselves from these experiences and try again and try again and then it happens again and you try again and i love that she's this dancer because and i want to ask you if your intention was we still have the wild female inside of us and so we want to be able to have this feminine fire and i love that you chose the fire fire men they have this the wild self and he's trying to lock down and contain it also and there's this t effort for the masculine to try to lock it down and she's trying to lock it down and she's cutting off her hair which i fully obviously relate to because after basic instinct i cut off my hair to try to stop the endless the attention and the people pulling my hair and my clothes off of my body. I couldn't take it anymore. The pulling at my clothes, the pull, especially the pulling at my hair. It was one thing to pull and tear my clothes off of me, but the pulling at my hair started to make me lose my mind. And I think that we get to that point. There's only so much you can take. 
I think that we want to get it off, off, you know, the assault off of us. And I thought it was so interesting, this thing where obviously the man knows from the start very soon oh, yeah. in their relationship what's going on. And he and he protects her. It's almost I, the word in English is whiff, like this small smell. Oh yeah, okay. Is alive in the firehouse that there's something with with her, yeah. and some of them know, but they don't want to know. I think also because the androgynous being that she is makes them very uncomfortable as well. Yes. There is this one, there is this scene that makes, always makes me laugh when uh, she's with other firemen in the kitchen and they're uh, prepping dinner. Uh -huh. And there is this guy who's kind of simple minded, who is the only one to actually pinpoint that there is something strange about her appearance. And the other guys go, no, 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 absolutely not. He's normal. He's normal. Like, and there is this whole thing about being the unsaid, about. Um, what a man should look like and what a woman should look like. And the fact that in our society, there is no space in between. Like it's supposed to look like that. Or it's supposed to look like that. And there is this, this kind of like really messy attempt to have a grasp on who that person is with them in the kitchen that is just so ridiculous on all of their parts, you know, because they're just, they have no clue. They have no, no tool to decipher that. Right. And, as far as if I can come back one second on what you said about him um, knowing from the get go that it's not his son uh, when he right. comes and picks her up at the airport. There is this thing that you said it's to protect her. I think that would be for me, it's true uh, to a certain extent, because there is this thing about this character of Vincent that he is actually for me at the beginning, someone who is really just like in vertigo, trying to live his fantasy. He's, he wants, no matter who that is, he wants to sculpt this, his fantasy of his son through that person and to make that person what he wants them to be. Well, so this, it's this is a very common human condition. <laughs> yes, absolutely, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. But at the same time, I do believe that all these lies that they tell each other at the start of their relationship and the violence that emanates from these lies, if you somehow, because they need each other, no matter what, and no matter yes. what they want, they need each other. And at one point, just it's animal between them like this, just start accepting the person that is close to them and with whom they live and they don't have another choice than that do they in order to survive and at one point it's just survival for both of them but relationships again do this yeah that's true. relationships <laughs> in general do this we choose people and we imagine them to be something. And then we begin to accept who they actually are. That's true. <laughs> out of our need, out of our desire, out of our hope to have someone. And we take this one that's near to us. And they aren't who we imagine them to be when we meet them, ever. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because like, you're, um, you're putting it in a very, like, let's say a real um, context that indeed is um, of the reality of a relationship. And in my head, it was al always like my fantasy of my film. So I always saw it through the dynamics of their own relationship that is really messed up. But I never realized how, it, how close it was from being um, uh, the dynamics of a relationship that you can have with anyone. Of human, yes, because we, I believe that in our artistic endeavors, we bring out our own pathology and the human yeah. pathology. And I think that this film is so, like you say, like a Hitchcock film, we bring out the deeper pathology in society. And you have brought out this pathology of female rage and the need 
the the male need to soothe this female rage, to touch it, to see it, to house it, to understand it, to to just stop being afraid of it, hold it in some way. We can't keep we can't we can't just keep going on with the men are afraid of this. We are releasing our rage now. We are finally saying we've had it. It's enough. This rage is coming out. Men are at first just men are like, wow, the rage is burning our eyebrows and our hair off and we're all hiding and we don't know what to do. I think that the, this film is is like men have to embrace this rage all the way through. Otherwise, women are just going to keep birthing nothing but female rage and how many rapes and misguided violent experiences become the birthing of the objects of this rage and we see a man who would like to heal his own brokenness from the his own actions really trying to understand and now he has the object of this this child in this house of masculinity now what happens for me the ending is quite optimistic somehow because i do believe that vincent is going to love that baby um no matter what it looks like and no matter what its gender is no matter what it's not um for me as a uh, binary in terms of female rage and um let's say masculine um what i say like uh, inability to cope with it because i'm trying to go against i think what you um see as also uh, gender stereotypes like expectation as far as women are concerned what you're supposed to be how you're supposed to act how limiting it is and how also very uh, aggressive it is to be yeah. under the weight of these stereotypes men also have stereotypes attached to their to their gender but unfortunately um women's bodies are always and have always been the subject of discussion like it has always been a subject of discussion of controversy of saying what a woman should look like um what a woman is supposed to do with her own body how is she supposed to have sex with whom blah 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 and all that and she's done well so that's the thing with the the, the, the stereotypes uh, attached to women are, are so impactful in, in in very violent ways that of course for me uh the, i i try to put the accent on it but my way to to handle them through my character is actually to just decide to get rid of the notion of gender for me gender is a social construct that has nothing to do with me that does not define me that um i'm not gonna abide by its rules by no way we can i mean you can have a gender be okay with the gender that you had at birth want to change gender and all that i'm not saying that gender does not exist i'm saying it's a social construct that does not define someone in society and i think that's what i'm trying to do with her and that stems absolutely from the rage i feel that as being targeted and stigmatized as a woman and that that's also my shower if you wish because you said about cleansing this thing i'm also trying to cleanse this idea that the only thing that I am, that i am is a woman and i am a lot of things and a woman but i am a lot of other things that i don't think that being a woman should define my path in life but it's too late to say you're sorry how would i know why should i care please don't bother trying to find her she's not there well, let me tell you i don't think that titan is really about of uh, sexuality per se i mean there is this one scene where my character has sex with a car which is a scene that is very um triggery um in order to uh you know understand the stakes of her evolution and also the sake of the relationship she's going to have with him because this is where she's going to start like having all these oil thing um leaking through her the metal in her body that is going to question whether she is still human or not so it's a very like it's a very pivot scene the moment that she uh, 
uh, has sex with the car because obviously it's going to determine a lot about um, um, what we think of a character and the fact that she actually humanizes at the same time that her body starts to uh, grow all these uh, spreading metal plates in her body and looks less and less human. The film is in its way like magical reality, the car and the Cadillac, which is representing something much deeper and much bigger in the female psyche. And yeah. it's that overarching, endless oppression that you cannot get out from under. And it just seems to keep rolling at you. And I thought was really beautifully expressed by the Cadillac. <laughs> it's that old school, nonstop, won't stop rolling your way. It's almost out of date. And then it starts to come back in style again. But I could tell you for 63 year old me, I know exactly what that Cadillac fucking you means because I've been fucked by that Cadillac my whole life. So I'm glad we're allowed to swear because I've been fucked by that fucking Cadillac for 45 fucking years. And I am real fucking tired of it. I know what it feels like to feel like you're being turned into machine parts as a result of it. Your back hurts, your feet hurt, your head hurts, your whole life hurts as a result of it. You just don't feel like you can even walk anymore or stand up anymore. And you don't even know that if you can remember what your femininity looks like, if you remember it for a second, you might die. Do you have another film in mind? Are you working on something? I'm working on my next one. I'm trying to work on my next one because I still have a lot of work on Titan. So I'm juggling with time a bit and I can't wait to be like fully into it. A lot of people ask me like, is it going to be... Is it kind of be in the same vein or whatever? This kind of questions, you know? And it's funny because I'm like, man, that's only my second feature. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I haven't even started yet. <laughs> what are you doing? Mm. Of course, it's going to be in the same vein. <laughs> that's, yeah, I'm not finished with everything that's in my head right now. So I can't wait to go back to it. I mean, I have nothing against platform and it's, for me, like a different um, way of thinking films. That's it, you know, but obviously my my heart goes for the theaters, like well, forever gone for the theaters. And I do believe that you, like as a director, you don't think your film um, lights or breakdown or sounds, you don't think it the same way if it's gonna be on a big, big screen or on a computer screen, it's impossible. So both can coexist, but it's not one or the other, I think. You must have learned so many things seeing your film. I know I've just written my first book and when it came out, I was like, oh, uh. and you must have learned making your film so many wonderful things that you want to now do in your next film. You must be just not do. <laughs> or not exactly not do. <laughs> or not do exactly. You're like, oh, Shit, I want to tr now I can do this now I can do that it's the wonderful aspect of nah. as you said I mean as you said at the beginning of the conversation um, about uh, your relationship with directing and how it's been like contained and all that and I must say that I feel very lucky nowadays that I can say I'm gonna do a third feature and that's like the best thing to me it makes me feel like safe and free for that moment because I'm a very cautious person so I never never uh, <laughs> predict very further but for, for the moment I feel like I, I, I feel blessed that I can do it because again it has not always been the case for women in this world <laughs> especially to do these kind of you know uh, groundbreaking uh, very exciting films and get away with it. I feel like you, you, is, got, yeah, I feel like this you did a bank robbery or something, and I'm like, yes, <laughs> you got it. You, you robbed the bank, you got the money, and you gave it to the charity, you're Robin Hood. <laughs> yeah, I feel this thing that I, will, I hope, you know what, I hope I will always feel like that. But even after having won the Palme d'Or, I still feel like an outsider. And I think I will feel like an outsider for a very long time, I think. Really I hope so. Yeah, I hope too. you always feel like an outsider. That'll mean that you're breaking new ground. 
Bye. Bye, Chili. <laughs>